Hey, Survival Nation. Welcome back to Skilled Survival Alliance podcast. I'm here with our expert, just in case, Jack. Hey, Brent. How's it going today? Good. Good. Great to hear. Hey, so last week we touched a little bit about uh, building a survival coalition and not, you know, going it alone, as, as they say. What exactly do you mean by go it alone versus a survival coalition? Yeah, there's no real, like, perfect definition for go it alone. It's not like it's not a dictionary or anything, but the way I like to frame that is basically going it alone is either an individual, right? That's pretty obvious. Or it's even a small family, right? Um, Especially families with younger children, right? If they're dependents and they, they don't provide much value in the terms of skills and abilities, and you're pretty much still taking care of them, I would consider that going alone for, for a survival situation. Um, you know, once kids are in the teens and, and whatnot, and they can help, uh, help out in some ways, in some skills, then, you know, at some point it's, it's no longer quite going it alone, if you will. Um, I guess just the way I like to think about it is that you need at least three work working adults to not be considered going it alone. And the more, the better really, um, up until a point. So, you know, if you have a hundred adults, that becomes a, a big issue and there's politics involved and, and that gets pretty crazy. But for this purpose, uh, a survival coalition is going to be a team of at least three adults, um, pr- preferably, you know, several more, right? 10, let's say. Right. That makes sense. So what age is it when, when your kids or, or, you know, minors or kind of go from, from being a, uh, maybe this isn't the right word, but maybe going from being a burden to, to being able to really pitch in and, and, uh, help the coalition. I personally grew up on a farm and I remember I was driving tractors at, at the age of eight and yeah, my mom wasn't very happy about it, but my dad was like, you know, I need your help. Get on the damn track. So, right. <laughs> so back then at, at age of seven or eight, I was, I was already chipping in and helping out where I could. Um, nowadays I couldn't, Im- you know, you, you look at most cities and, and kids growing up and you know, that age, uh, they help around the house. Sure. But, but what kind of skills do they have? You know, could they chop firewood? Could they, you know, could they drive a vehicle? You know, even, even if it was on a gravel road, probably not. So, um, I think nowadays, you know, you're going to probably be more in the age of, of teenager, uh, before they really, um, but, but at the age of eight, if something happened, you, you can, you can train and teach. Right. Right. So, so now that we, we have a bit better understanding of, of what you mean by going it alone, do you have any specific reasons why you'd recommend, uh, not going it alone when, you know, when the big one hits the fan? Yeah, I do. Uh, first and foremost, I think it's pretty obvious that uh, there's just so much to do. Um, if you don't have electricity, if you don't have running water, um, just your everyday basic sanitary chores, your basic food, uh, food replenishment plans, you know, growing a garden, going hunting, um, you know, even prepping your food, that's all just going to be take 10 times more work than it currently does in today's environment, right? We, we lose all those, those easy push button type uh, things, you know, you, you can't just come home and turn your heat on, right? You have to, you know, if you have heat, it's going to be build a fire and, and be able to harness that heat. And those are all harder to do. Um, basically in the, in the, Beyond the bug out bag, which is our newsletter, I'm actually writing a four, maybe five part series. I'm still in the middle of it. Um, and that is going to kind of show the difference between today's life and, and potential future shit hits the fan type life and how that corresponds with frontier life back in the 1800s. And it's a pretty neat series, but basically one thing it does detail out in that series. So, you know, I recommend everybody read it, but um, it really highlights how much more work and how much more skills and knowledge people really need for those old school skills. And so doing, going alone, there's just really at the end of the day, there's just too much to do for one person. Um, you really either need to have a coalition or you just need to have some, some shared 
bartering going on, which is also coalition. So that's the first and primary reason. Right. And so for, for everybody here in Survival Nation, um, go to the Survival Dashboard. Just go to our Alliance dashboard there and, and uh, be on the bug out bag, the newsletter. Uh, they're all they're all archived right there. So um, is the uh, series going to start in the September issue? September 2015 issue is when the series will begin. Great. And and one thing that, that I remembered as you're talking about that, about, you know, working on the farm and, and how one person just can't do everything. I think back to, to my uh, great grandfather, um, my great grandfather settled a little town and him and his brothers uh, built this homestead and, you know, they had some children and, and it was like one huge, huge uh, coalition really. And it was a, a, a family, but multiple families were all working this land together. Mm-hmm. Exactly. And so just like you're saying how, you know, one person can't do it. So, um, you know, that's an interesting way to, to think about it. Uh, now, is this the only reason you'd want to build a survival coalition or, or are there more? There's a lot of reasons, but I would say the, the second primary reason that a lot of people forget about is, you know, sleep. <laughs> right. You know, it's, it's a universal truth. We all need it. Um, you can't go, you can go, you can go a couple days without sleep, but um, it's almost like the whole food argument. Like try to go, you know, three days without sleep and see how well you're doing and how sane you are. Right. Um, Cody Mo wrote a post. Um, he's one of our skilled survival authors for the blog and he writes for us occasionally. And he wrote a really great article about sleep deprivation and, and it has some studies on that and some other things. But at the end of the day, um, if you don't have a sleep plan, uh, you're going to, you're going to run up into to problems. Um, for instance, if you're going it alone and you're worried about, you know, people sneaking on your property or, or, you know, worried about nighttime thefts or burglaries or bandits or whatnot. So you're staying up late in the night and you're trying to keep watch. Um, so you're not getting much sleep. And then the next day you got to get up and do all the things we just talked about, right? Uh, grow food and build fires and all that stuff. It's just too much for one person. So you really need a group of people so that you can share that burden at night, keep a good watch, rotate sleep schedules and everybody gets a fair amount of sleep and then everybody can pull their weight during the day as well. So, uh, sleep is very important. I couldn't agree more. I mean, you know, last, last, uh, episode of the, the podcast here, we talked about, you know, skipping dinners and, and we had a little chuckle there because I said, I, I, I don't skip that many and same with sleep. You know, I, I need a lot of sleep and I need uh, sleep consistently and I know for, for sure when I haven't had enough sleep, um, it's almost like I'm walking around drunk. And it, the interesting thing about that is they've actually done studies where they'll put yep. people behind the wheel. Yep. Um, and people who are, are tired, who haven't, haven't had enough sleep, they perform worse than people who are drunk. Right. So it's absolutely a, a crucial part of, of everyday life and even especially survival. There was a radio host, I forget his name, but basically he pulled a stunt where he was going to stay up for like a week and, and not fall asleep at all. And and he did it, but he's still fighting psychological effects from that. Wow. That's how important it is, is, is years later, he's still a little insane um, and has been diagnosed to be insane because he stayed up for that long. And that some of that's, uh, you know, in that article that, that Cody Mo wrote that that was really interesting as I was reading through it and just like amazed at it, how how sleep can really affect our psyches. I was talking with a guy last week uh, while I was on vacation, and we we're talking about Guinness Book of World Records. And he actually this came up. He mentioned that um, uh, the sleep category uh, there used to be a Guinness World Record of of the most hours or the longest time without sleep. Guinness actually got rid of that because it's, it was determined to be uh, too dangerous. So, right. So a little off topic, but. Uh, uh, a couple of random points there. So, so the two biggest reason for reasons for a coalition are one is to share all the work, and two is to get some sleep. Mm-hmm. So, how do you go about creating this survival coalition so you can uh, divide and conquer and and get some sleep in the in in between? Well, first of all, I recommend starting your coalition today. Um, 
if you wait until shit hits the fan, you're going to get your neighbors and you're going to get leftovers. So you're in right. a crapshoot, right? You're really not picking and choosing, you know, the best of the best. You're, you're just left with whatever's there. And, um, you know, that's just not ideal. So, uh, the best thing to do is t- today, try and find some like-minded people. Um, I always say, look at family first, um, especially if they're local. I know all, not all families see it eye to eye, but oftentimes they do. And when they do, that's just the easiest, best way. And, and, and to be honest, if, if, if that's the best solution for you, you're probably already doing it. <laughs> that's probably already in the works. Um, and if they're not local, how far are they? You know, if they're like-minded and they're, you know, 60 miles north, well, that, that's a bug out opportunity right there. So keep that in mind. If, if family's not an option, either you don't, they don't see eye to eye or they're just way too far away. Obviously friends, the people you hang out with would be the next best. So, um, you know, if, if you and your friends haven't quite, you know, teamed up to that level that you want to, it's time to step up and, and see if they're willing to start talking about some of this stuff and, and, and see if, you know, you can come up with a plan together. Right. Um, and then your third option would be, you know, neighbors and, and people like that. Um, so one thing you can do, and there's another blog post that we wrote about, you know, uh, survival coalition, who can you really trust? And it really focuses in on your neighbors. It's kind of this third option I'm talking about. And you want to secretly interview your neighbors. You want to find out what they do for, for a living. You know, are they a mechanic? Are they an electrician? Those kinds of skills will come into play and be great skills. You want to barter with those people at a minimum. Um, And and if they can be more and be part of a coalition, um, then that's great too. Um, So you can have just a simple conversation with them. And the other thing you can do is just observe your neighbors, right? Um, One thing that you can tell a lot from a person is just what they do outside their home. Do they mow their own lawn? Do they change their own oil? Do you notice things like that or does it seem like people come over and take care of that kind of stuff for them? That'll tell you volumes about how so independent that person is and how many skills they have. Um, maybe you can find out who has firearms with just, you know, some conversation. Mention you, hey, you have this gun and see if they reciprocate with, you know, what what they have and, and who is of sane mind and who's an asshole and who's weak and who won't add value. All those things are important. They matter. And especially if you're not planning on bugging out, if you're planning on bugging in, then you need to know. And if you are bugging out, you need to know your, the neighbors that'll be surrounding you in, in the bug out location. Sure. It might be remote, but that doesn't mean that there's not a, a neighbor a half mile away. Right. And that person may be c- coming handy when, you know, she hits a fan, you bug out. Next thing you know, you got a new neighbor. And if you don't know them from Adam, you know, that's not going to be a great scenario. So you even want to get to know your neighbors, no matter where you're going to be hunkering down. Right. So it's best just kind of approach them, get to know them a little bit. Um, Absolutely. Ask them. Decide whether it's something, if you want to pursue a, a further relationship with this person or if this person, somebody you want to keep steer clear of. Right. Right. So ask them. Are they going to be a liability to your family survival? Right. If the answer is, Yes, then stay the hell away from them. And if the answer is no, they're, they're, they're not a liability, then the next question is what skills do they have that you can utilize and then go from there. So it sounds like neighbors can be a bit of a double-edged sword. Absolutely. Absolutely. They can be good or bad. So what about uh, neighbors from different generations? You know, a guy, uh, on one side of my house, I've got a guy who's in his late 70s. And on the other side, um, I've got uh, a young family with uh, with a with a young kid. Um, how, what do you recommend? Or do you have any advice for dealing with, you know, retired folks versus millennials with young families? You always have to look at the individuals. You can't just you can't just pigeonhole people into one category. But there are some trends that you need to be aware of, right? Um, just to kind of help you understand maybe where people are coming from and help you understand how useful they would be. Um, So it really comes down to the trust of the individual. So if there's young families out there and you live in next to them, 
some of the things you want to know is, do they work hard? Do they, are they independent minded? Do they have a lot of skills? Or at least at a minimum, are they showing great potential for skills? Um, and then there's the millennials. And these are the ones you want to watch out for, right? These are the ones that aren't going to be very helpful at all and maybe even a liability. And, and they're the ones I call the entitled generation. Uh, and by saying that, I, I bet a lot of the listeners know exactly what I'm talking about. Right. It's the kids who have never experienced the hard days of honest work. Uh, they don't even know what that looks like. Um, they've had everything handed to them. They don't know how to live without their cell phones. They just don't want to get their hands dirty, right? That That's a huge watch out, right? That they're going to be a problem. You know, if, if they've never done that, don't expect them to just flip a light switch when things get crazy. They're, you know, they're, they're probably not going to be the kind of person you want in your coalition for sure. Um, really, you could ask somebody their hobbies, right? If you're out at a, at a barbecue for a neighborhood barbecue, or if you just see them in the park, let's say near your house or something like that, just, just get to know them a little bit, you know? And, and if they say, Hey, if you say, what's your hobby? And they say, Hey, I'm into video games and watching TV, you know, take note of that. It might not be a ton of value there. They say they're into hunting, fishing, camping, barbecuing, sewing, whatever. Those are skills that you can use. As far as older generations, it's really the same idea, but you're probably more likely to find some decent skills. I mean, these people have been on this earth longer than most of us. You know, they're in their 60s or 70s. So they might have a vast amount of knowledge that you have no idea about. And if you can figure that out ahead of time, great. And if you can tap into that, even better. Um, the only thing I would watch out for elderly is obviously, you know, at some point they become almost dependents like children, right? Um, if they're family, you deal with that. But if they're not family, then you don't want them a part of your coalition necessarily because they're going to drag you down, right? If, if they're handicapped uh, in some major way, um, it's, it's just not somebody you want a part of your, your survival coalition. They're not bad people. But you get to pick and choose your coalition, and so just be aware of that. Those are just some basic observations and conversations you need to have with people. That's great stuff, Jack. Um, Those are definitely some smart ways to think about your survival coalition. What are some other ways that people can connect beyond your neighbors or your your immediate family? Like, you know, how do I how do I find like minded people like me that live in this area without you know putting up a billboard saying? Hey, I'm a prepper. Uh, come eat all my food. What's really cool is the, the internet, right? That's that's probably the one tool that the people of the 1800s didn't have. They didn't have the internet. And the internet has its good points and it has its bad points. But one of the best things about the internet is it's a huge knowledge base, but it also it's a connecting tool, right? So not only does it have a ton of knowledge on it where you can learn and develop your skills, but you can connect with people who are like-minded. Forums. Forums are great. A lot of I've seen some forums, if, if you do some searching, that have different states within those forums. And, and then if you see a state forum, throw on, hey, I, I'm from, you know, X town. Is anybody else on here from X town? And if somebody raises their hand, there you go. They got one person, maybe two or three people respond back. Um, seriously, it's check out forums. Um, use your survival. Use the keyword survival group in your location and see what comes up. You just never know. I would also recommend that you, you join groups. I call them shoulder niche groups. So they might not be like totally survival focused, but they have a similar uh, set of attitudes or skills, if you will. Um, one that, that sticks out to mind, and there's several, but one that, that I can share with you is like the ham radio group, right? Ham radio is one of the best survival communication tools if, if there's no electricity and all the cell phone networks are down ham radio is going to be the guys that are getting on there and, and communicating with each other so um you know these these people are typically they're prepared uh they're they're like-minded and if it's a group that's meeting locally they're probably local so you know there you go start talking to some of those people and see if see what they have to say and you might be able to start a coalition with some of those guys Worst case scenario, you can always put up a Craigslist ad, you know, put it, put in something along the lines of starting a survival coalition in whatever town you live, set up a moving date, set up a time, set up a location, 
Just see who shows up. Step up, be a leader, get involved, start something. People who lead and prepare now are the ones who will survive worst case shit hits the fan scenarios. So you need to come together and you need to survive. Those are all great places to start looking for for survival coalition. Absolutely. Well, hey Jack, uh, I got nothing else to 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 ask. We've I think we've covered this topic really really well today. And um, is there anything last uh, comments or anything you wanna you wanna say to Survival Nation? I just think people should uh, really focus on finding like minded people today. And once again, just to sum things up, it all comes down to people you can trust and people who add value. Um, trust and value. Just remember those two words when you're choosing your coalition. Now go out there and find some like-minded people. Well, Survival Nation, you heard it from the man himself, just in case, Jack. Trust and values. Those are two really important things to, to keep in mind when you're putting your coalition together.